to our dad on the Jim Crespin Podcast. Welcome to the Jim Crespin Podcast. Unfiltered, conversational exploration, and I couldn't think of a better guest to do that with today than my good friend Dale Peters from Dale Speaking. Welcome, buddy. Thank you, Jim. It is a pleasure to be invited, a pleasure to look at another handsome man that has style all at the same time. You and I share that, and I really appreciate that. (laughs) Well, I don't think I am anywhere near to your level of style, brother. I have seen some of those suits and and jackets and shirts that you can pull off, pants as well. I can't can't pull off any of that. So um, I am looking forward to seeing you in person next time, not only because I enjoy your effervescent uh, personality in the conversation, but also to just check out what you're wearing. I've got a few things I've got, you know, ready for the CCMAs and uh, I've got a, um, I've got a t-shirt thing happening when uh, the MDM unplugged tour is happening. So you'll, you know, um, Mike Denny will take care of that. But I mean, I, I started, this all started off because of Mike Denny more than anything, because I'm just the guy who dresses the way I dress. I like to be complete. If it's all green, it's all green. If it's all white, it's all whatever it is. Right. And I'm, and I'm really, I, I really love clothing. I love clothing as a young person. The first things I would do, my parents had told me was I was sketching dresses and pantsuits and stuff like that. Cause I really liked what my mother was wearing. And I certainly took a notion, notion from that. Now, um, you know, the good news is I, I, unfortunately, I didn't get into d- design, but I certainly have gotten into design in a different way, as in designing, you know, how you br- how you help an artist come along, you know, even with des- designs on my own stuff that I'm working on, um, as in um, the my first mini movie, you know. So those are all pieces, I think, that have come along through all that p- portion. And I have to say, Jim, um, I always thought I was creative in, you know, in the way of, well, you're a painter or you're a sculptor. And I tried those things and I wasn't, though, those things. And I'm not an accountant. Right. I'm a, I love music. I love and breathe it. And to me, it's it's just the effervescence of it. And then once you start adding music with people, then it really becomes fun for me, far as I'm concerned, because without people, there is, why, why is there music, right? <laughs> you know, well, I think there's a, like there's a story there that resonates with a lot of people. And I've, I've always said, you know, most people don't follow their head into the music industry. They follow their heart, right? And sure. most people who end up in the industry and, and successful at high levels for long periods of time really love uh, the artistic struggle and they love the music. And, and for me, music has always been my drug of choice. You know, it is that one thing that I can take that doesn't have any nefarious side effects that completely changes my state of being. Yes. And um, and for you, I would imagine that you felt that same euphoric feeling early in your life. So let's talk a little bit about your origin story and what it was that drew you to the business. Yeah, so... My parents, I, I come from a Mennonite background, right? Um, so my parents always found music. It was an escape for them, my father more than anybody, because he played organ and piano and he'd be in the choir, you know, in the church choir, and he would do all that stuff. In the good old days, you know, when you would separate men from women on both sides of the church. That's how men and I, you know, we were in that way. But that's how that was. I mean, so we're talking 60s now right we're talking before that sort of veil lifted you know and as my father just kept, always showed to me that music was super important to him I mean the first things he loved you know when he decided that he wanted to venture out he, country music was his thing you know and he we would have eight tracks and he would play Porter Wagner Dolly Parton uh, uh, Charlie Pride was one of his favorite artists right so you know Little Jim, Jim Reeves in there? No, yeah, no Jim Reeves in there no. or any, no, he, he kind of stuck to what was on the radio more or less, right, to that. And so he really kind of, because anything outside of that to him was, well, I don't know, that's, uh, you know, he was a little afraid of what else was out there, knowing that he would really dig and love it, but wasn't sure that that was going to mix with his faith, right, you know, right. as much. And so there was that real faith battle that happened between faith and music you know i mean i i recall being a young man just really loving music like uh, 17 years old and i remember going it was i was living in calgary i went to a this hypnotist guy called ravine 
right? Ravine, this guy who would make you cluck like a chicken. Or, Man, you know, they call Ravine. Yeah, we all remember those, those commercials if you grew up on the prairies. That's exactly it, right? So I remember going and going, well, Ravine, he can take care of me. And he'll take the rock and roll out of me. And of course, the last thing I listened to before I hit the Jubilee Auditorium where he was performing was, you know, Jimi Hendrix. And so then I go and do the thing and he does all his stuff and I go out and I go, shut up. Yeah, I plug it. I go, yeah, feels even better than before. And then I realized that it was more about the trappings around me that I had taken on personally, as opposed to letting the music do the speaking into me and really enjoying that, whatever kind of music that was. And that really kind of started me on my way, on my journey of going, music is my thing. And it, it was so soul renewing for me all the time. And I would always kind of block it off and go, no, that's, that's sin, that's sin. And then realized, uh, it's not so sinful. If you're singing in church, well, you can sing outside. Maybe it's with a guitar. Maybe it's not. But I kind of got through that pretty quickly. Well, and if you've ever traveled to the southern United States and attended uh, one of their uh, Christian churches down there, you can attended a service, I should say. Uh, you can see that there's this beautiful marriage between uh, structure, religion, and artisticness and and losing yourself in the music and in the hymns and um it's it's an interesting dichotomy though i would imagine that as much as you tried to pull away from music having this idea of what you thought it was based on the religious teachings at the time mm. there was a part of you that was probably pulled even closer to it because we all have this yin and yang within us right and it's like the more we try to suppress something that we really love the more we actually chase it unconsciously and, and I would imagine that that factored into you finally getting into this place where you're like, OK, you know what? I've realized that there's nothing wrong with this and that, you know, music is a tool like anything else. And I can use it for goodness or I can use it to feed the worst parts of my character and personality. <laughs> yes. And I, you know, I didn't really realize that that second part you said, the work parts for your character until I got older, right? Because I, I kind of struggled into my 20s by going like uh, sin, good, you know, bad, evil, that sort of stuff. Too much, too much time in my own head, you know, and that's, I don't lay that on my parents at all. I mean, that's, I was just, I'm so delicate in that way to take everything on that way that, that it, everything it seems to me very personal when when many times it's not personal at all. It's just what it is. And I really brought myself in my 61 years to that point where music just washes with me and it's one. I'm one with it. And there's no more of those things. And I think that's really been uh, helpful to me to let that go. And it's really helped me in the business I'm in now because I don't know if I, you know, the early part of the business when I joined RCA in 1984 before they became BMG in 85 and Brian and Arista, you know, I was like, I was just a guy selling records and eight tracks up to that point. Well, not eight tracks, maybe, but cassettes and stereos because that's what I did, right? I did that in order to augment my other job, which is I was working to be an electrician and I can, I can pull wire and put up boxes like the best of them, but then, but, but all the, all the math and the arithmetic that you have to go to school for, for two years, not good. Not good for me at all. <laughs> and, and, but that was okay, right? Because I kind of go, okay, then this really, I'm, you know, I'm really kind of etching myself out. And that's kind of what introduced me to myself a little bit more of the love of music and then selling the love of music to people and then selling stereos and all that. That to me was fascinating. That was a world. And because of that, because I was, I was doing well as a guy on the sales floor, and I was one of only four punks in that were living in Calgary. You know, half my head shaved, and the other had, you know, you know, straight up hair like bullets. You know, the, the kind of clip on earrings, always wearing a Bajas T-shirt with chains on. You know, literally, I was a bit of a sideshow for a lot of people who came in. But I was, I, but they listened at the same time. You know, oh, if you like, if you like Rick Spring, Springfield, Jesse's Girl, you'll like. Well, whatever it was, right? You know, you know, like in excess, I'll say for, for an example. But it was because of that and that sort of belief with people around back towards me that, you know, it wasn't about how I looked. It's about what I had to say and to deliver. And I think you started off the conversation basically at the beginning of this um, podcast about that. And I think that's so important for people to, you know, who aren't finding maybe their way or struggling a little bit is to, you know what? 
The past is not just the past, it's learning, but it's about bringing that forward and then letting yourself live within it and then let it explode because you know what? Yeah, to help somebody out, and that's what we really do in this business a lot is helping each other out, right? In order to build not just careers, build our own, but build out there and help our fellow broadcasters or promoters like yourself or whatever that is and getting the good word of music out there. And I, I say to most people, um, a lot of times when I'm calling and they say, how am I doing? I said, well, I'm keeping the world uh, out of bad music, right? Because I can give you bad music, but I'm not going to. <laughs> I think, uh, I think you touched on something that's really important there, which is the best way to build your own legacy in this business is to be indispensable to people who are building their own. You know, if you are if you are adding more value than anybody else in the equation, then your name, your reputation is just going to grow and develop. And um, I think one of the secrets of your success, and I want to get into the whole indie artist thing, because although I know you run a company and I don't want to ask you to give away your trade secrets for free, but I want to delve into that aspect of yeah. how do you do this properly? How do you get your song from this this uh concept that you've been able to translate into music on this into some sort of commercial form that makes it of interest to radio but but i think one of the things at the root of your success is passion and enthusiasm and that can't be faked you know and anytime i run into somebody who's miserable in this business who's been in this business for 20 or 30 years it's because they've lost their passion and enthusiasm and you haven't which speaks to why you probably have had one of your best years ever Yes. Since COVID came down, I mean, the, the level of success you're having with Jess Moskaluk, uh, Tyler Joe um, Miller, and uh, and then, of course, you know, your history of working with Pink, the Foo Fighters, the Backstreet Boys, uh, Britney Spears, um, you've just been killing it. So let's start with that. If you're an indie artist and you have this song, you have this vision for it, how do you start to build a reputation for it that might garner the interest of people at radio who can take it to a much broader audience? I think it comes down to exactly those things you said. It is the passion, it's that, but it's being truthful. It's being very honest and truthful. And that is, even when, you know, I'm pitching my own songs at the same time. It might not be, I, have a, I had a song last year that I wasn't crazy about, but was right in, you know, a country song, no less on MDM. So, you know, don't watch this part, Mike. <laughs> but anyway, I was honest with people, Mike Danny being the, being the owner of MDM Recordings, which I've been with for 14 years, uh, thankfully, him and I worked side by side. But I was very honest about the song. I said, it's not my favorite song of this package, but you know what? It's a great song. Here's the reasons, right? And it's, a, it's about being truthful about it. So pitching radio, you know, is one thing. Pitching, I would imagine, a promoter is a somewhat different because there's different um, pieces that you need for that. I know pitching when I'm pitching CBC or Sirius or Stingray for that matter, they're looking for different mechanisms than than radio itself is looking for. And so let and me just stop you there part. for a second. What are some of the different mechanisms or measurements that they're looking for at the DSPs than, than radio is looking for? At the DSPs, I can't speak as much of because I only dealt with the DSPs in the early days, right? But when those early days were happening, you know, I can remember George saying, well, it comes down to the music and the package. What do you have? What Do you have great music here? What do you have? Let's listen to it. And you sit there and listen to it with the other person. And I think that's that's the mark of then, no, then deciding, you know, that person can decide with you, right, as opposed to you doing the pitch. And, you know, those kind of meetings are so super important. It's no different than when we take songs to radio. You know, we're doing more of a package deal where we take a couple songs to radio and say, what do you think? What's going on, you know, you know, because I listen to country radio eight, well, seven to eight hours a day. I go right across the country, back and forth. I listen to different day parts and radio stations are different in their own unique way. Right. So it's kind of like, well, then I, it's best for me to understand what those radio stations are doing, whether they're in a pure vein where they're a little bit more pop, whether it's Rogers, where there's a little bit more older stuff coming through. You know, it's about understanding what they're doing at the end of the day. That's how I can place a song. If I don't understand that, then it's really difficult. And for an indie artist, that indie artist needs to do a lot of understanding of what 
their song is, but not just their song, because you know what? I feel for indie artists in a lot of cases, because it's really, it's just them and it's about them. And they don't have a lot of people around them to say yes, no, maybe so. I mean, it's at the end of the day, it's your family and your family loves you, whether it's crappy or not. Let's face it. It's just Yeah, true. You, you, need, you need some people who are willing to be brave enough and courageous enough in the process to give you some really objective feedback. And that is tough to garner. And and honestly, I struggle with it too. When artists are like, hey, what do you think of my song? I'm like, well, I think it's great. I don't know if radio is going to play it. But you mentioned something that I want to touch on again, because the, the importance of research, and especially if you're looking for uh, to build a story initially at radio, listening to those stations online, there's no excuse why anybody can't listen to almost anything these days. And then understanding the marketplace nuances of that station and what they are supporting. You know, if it's if it's CFCW, uh, you know, obviously was an Edmonton, Alberta based radio station, understanding that they lean more to the traditional country side of things. So if you have a real, uh, you know, pop version of a song that's a collaboration with a pop artist like uh, Mackenzie Porter and Virginia to Vegas right now, they're probably not going to play that. Right. I shouldn't say that they probably they might, but they're probably more likely to play something more straight down the pike for their audience, which would be traditional country music. And that is something that I think gets lost a lot of times when artists are like, how do I get my song on radio? It's like, well, have you done enough research to understand what radio wants? Have you taken the time to listen to them? to understand the product they present to their listeners into the marketplace to know whether or not you would even be a fit. Yeah. Well, and outside of MDM recordings that I work so tightly with, I, I have the other piece of my business, which is strat, strat, strategy and marketing and calendaring, right? Where you literally sit with that independent artist and then you go through song one and you dig everything out you can from that artist to understand so that they can go and understand. Because you know what? It's like, Radio, I tell every indie artist I talk to now, I said, if radio was at the beginning, it's now at the end for you. And I'll tell you, that does not go over well at all with any of them because they want radio. They want a manager and they want to play a venue. That's what artists want. At the end of the day, I would thought I would thought maybe in, you know, 2021 with the Internet and the social platforms and yada, yada, all that kind of good stuff. I'm not shading that but yeah, there's a place for all of that those are tools to your point jim you know it's kind of like you have to see beyond what because radio doesn't have to break artists anymore and they don't they don't really break artists by the time an artist gets to that point i mean and i think there's some uniqueness i'll speak for the countryside and you mentioned tyler joe miller that's lightning in a bottle that just doesn't that just doesn't happen all the time that happens one and maybe well in my experience maybe once or Twice, maybe once on a major labor where we saw that happen, where something just exploded, where they weren't anticipating or accept, were ready for it. But you know, that has to be looked upon, right? Because if you have if you have so many other tools, and nowadays people have so many tools to work with, it's just working with the tools that you're comfortable with. Let's start off with you know anybody out there on YouTube. Well, how many people are on YouTube that don't even watch their own video more than you would think? That's a bit of a problem. That doesn't show that you're. You're doing, you're interested in your own self. You know, if you're not doing any kind of campaign behind that video, you know, it's no different than with a song. Have a campaign, understand what that is. Understand the niche you're going for or the gravity of what YouTube has for you. I mean, Iron Maiden's a prime example of who know, who understands YouTube? Iron Maiden does. Like, if you want to see the kind, they are the, they were con they're considered one of the top bands on YouTube, right? And and music isn't at the top anymore. Music's way down in the back there, probably somewhere, maybe not as top fifty. I please don't. That's not a fact, as far as I know. But two years ago, it was in the top fifty, right? So I remember prior pandemic, it was. So you know, music isn't as there as much. But Iron Maiden understood like. We do these little bits, the, we continue to feed our audience, and then we can regurgitate our old shows and new merch with old merch. And those guys really, they're making a great buck. I mean, you know, Dickinson flies his own plane around. I mean, his own plane. 
to do shows, right? You know, when they can do shows, but they really understood the nuances. No different than I think, you know, rappers and hip hoppers understood that you feed people, they'll stay with you, right? That's how you keep people engaged. You feed them, feed them. Now we're getting dressed. Now we're getting ready for the show. Now we're on our way to the show. Now we're, now we're, you right. know, exclusive content. Continuation. And that's what lose people because, you know, on these beautiful tools called phones, which I say is a tool, it's not a lifestyle. This is a tool. If you use this tool right, and I only talked about YouTube. I mean, there's TikTok out there. Young kids aren't on the only ones on TikTok anymore. They're not. I mean, you know what? They just aren't because it's another great place to go, right? So it's about utilizing all those things and Brand new artists have the opportunity to create a strategy and plan for themselves on one song that they can make live for a year long. I mean, we see how some labels are really staying with the song for a long time. Lee Bryce is an example right now. I'd say uh, uh, I'm going to forget the guy's name. <laughs> Two guys from the States, one with Brad Paisley and... Oh, Jimmy Allen, Jimmy Allen and Brad Paisley. There's a song that's come right back completely. I know on the MDM side, we've done it a couple of times, not in, during the pandemic. Before that, we were able to bring a song back. But that's because we armed ourselves with a plan and a strategy and stuff to do and say, right? Because that's what you want to do. And you want your audience to be as, you know, there with you as much as because radio people are all over their phones and checking stuff on Instagram and checking TikTok. I mean, you know, pop people, that's all they do is they live on TikTok. They don't. They don't take calls. They No, Dale. I was told, Dale, we're not taking a call. You send an email. That's what you send. Like, Jim, that kills me. I'm a phone guy. I'm a talk to you. Let's shake hands. Let's have a lunch. You know, I'm that dude, you know, but that's not how a lot of people do the business that way. Hence, I'm not in the pop world anymore because the country world still has handshakes and people and, you know, great podcasts like you're doing here and then Zooming people. I literally built myself another level during the pandemic. The minute I knew it, I thought, this is all about relationships. As I've always known, I'm going to go out there and really solidify more relationships. The relationships I'm afraid of, 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 you know, of creating between this other person because I'm afraid, not because they're afraid, but because I'm afraid. And boy, did that ever turn things around. And that helped with that success of 2020 in its own, in its own way, where it's carrying over into 2021. And I think that helped the company at the same time do the same thing, not just because I was doing it, but they were hearing like, look, it's all about people at the end of the day. And if we care- it's a relationship business, but but as I understand it and what I've experienced is that it's a it's become more hybridized. Yes. It's relationships and data, right? Because a programmer or a DSP programmer or a satellite radio, they might all think you're a great guy, take your call every time. But at the end of the day, if you don't have the story built around the song, if you don't have the data to back it up, if you can't prove the consumers are in demand of this product uh, product and interested in it then it is very hard to make the case to get them to give you the real estate on the air. And I understand that. The only downside to it, and I wonder if you agree with me on this, is it's really taken away the ability for programmers who were mavericks, who were trailblazers, to roll the dice, take a chance on an indie artist that nobody else could get, and maybe create a story. John Marks did that so successfully. Oh. That's serious for so many years where, you know, it doesn't matter if it's Florida Georgia Line or Dustin Lynch or, you know, it's tons of examples. Canadians, Jess Moskaluk, Chad Brownlee, where he would believe enough in an artist and go, you know what, I'm going to give this a shot. And then mm -hmm. he would expose the music to his audience. His audience would respond or not, but most of the time they would. And in some cases, he created global superstars. And we're seeing less of that because people are more reliant now on the data than their gut feel. Uh, yeah, I can recall when Clear Channel took, you know, like 51% of the market share of radio in the States. And this we're talking many years ago, right? Well, last 10 years at least, right? And that did the same thing happened there is more or less what's Canada is going through. And you know what? It, it came down to people like a John Marks as a maverick to push through all of that, right? I mean, not throwing anything on Clear Channel, but I mean, when you own 51%, that's, 
You better become, you, you better know those people, first of all, at Clear Channel. And number two, you better have your data to your point and everything else up and ready. And you better have great effing songs. You better, because they're not going to take, you might not get through that door again, right? And I find here in Canada that the relationships, the strength of the relationships here gives you that opportunity. But you do have to have the data. You do have to have the uh, music. And you have to have a strategy. Because why would a radio partner, right, jump aboard your ship if you don't have a plan i got a song so everybody's got a song yeah what does that mean and that's no different than me talking to independence it's like you got a song well what else do you have there's got to be more when i work this when i work radio and or cbc series or stingray those people are looking for some it's just whatever that's going to get them going and you know on cbc for julian tuck he's a real guy into sound you better have sound you better have a decent and solid sound and he wears he wears really expensive cans on his head right so he can hear all the intricacies he talked to me about an artist last week that i really believe in and he just said you know did you listen to the song and i said i listened and i hear there's there's some little bit of production discrepancy. He said, there's a lot. I can't hear the vocals enough. He says, I can't play this song. I like this song. I can't play it, right? And that's on me and the artist to make sure that he has that. It's not about sliding something by because nothing gets slid by anymore because those gatekeepers, so as me being considered as a gatekeeper, I'm expected to bring that quality and that data. And if I don't have that, well, the song's not going to get on the radio. And that's not going to help me on my next song and my next song because there's always another song. But have to be prepared, research, have a great song, and have other great songs. Know that you got it in your back pocket. I guess it's like playing poker. I mean, you know, it's kind of like you kind of, if you're not a card counter, well, then you're hoping, right? <laughs> I don't even know if that's a thing, card count. I know it is from seeing a movie called The, the Card Counter. But I mean, <laughs> outside yeah, of that. Right, man. Rain Man was a card counter. Yeah. Rain Man was a card counter. And look how well yeah. that did for him. <laughs> yeah, totally. But but I, I get the core of what you're saying here, which is, you know, you, you have to have quality. Like it starts with quality. And if you don't have that, um, then you could do more damage than good, frankly, by mm -hmm. putting out a single, right? So there's this like, blockchain of quality control in our industry where mm. uh there's guys like you out there who if an artist comes to you and says listen i have the money to pay your retainer here's my product you know that even if you take the money it could cost you credibility if the product isn't up to snuff so in a world where so much of music is subjective how do you discern that how do you go this is good this is not this is of the quality where I actually think I can add value and do something. And even though this person might pay me, I don't think I can move the needle for them at all. And frankly, I don't want to take their product to the marketplace. How do you make those decisions uh, doing what you do? Um, once I receive a song, that's where it starts for me first, when people reach out because they more than likely they want pricing and when can we start and all that. And I, I stop that right away and say, I need to listen to the song and or songs. Do you have one or do you have an EP or what do you have for me? I start there. And then I listen three different ways. I listen, first of all, I just listen. Just listen. I make sure I'm not on my computer. Not, I'm not doing something else because that always takes away from my, from my listening pleasure, that's for sure. So I go that about. Then I the second round. I give, it a, I give it some time. I walk away from the song. I come back. I listen again and I kind of go, okay, would I put this on my playlist? Walk away and come back a third time. Can I apply this song to wherever they want? And let's say radio. Does that apply? If it does apply, well, then that kind of gives me a, a, a tick on that box for sure, right? I mean, I'm more concerned about than the first two because if the third box is ticked, well, then do I like it as a fan? Do I want to hear it, right? Now, Can I again, be passionate so and enthusiastic enough to yeah. uh, infect other people with my passion and enthusiasm that might lead to this song actually achieving some level of marketplace success. Yeah. Without yeah, my I mean, passion, listen, I can't sell it. I can't sell. I can't sell. You know, as my dad would say, you can't sell, you, you can't make a, a pig's ear into a silk purse, yeah. right? A sow's ear into a, uh, you know, into a silk purse. And it's very true. You know, you can't, you know, if the song's not good, that song's not good. Yeah. <laughs> it's just simple. 
Yeah, no, I, my dad used to kind of made his own said, uh, you can't put Lamborghini paint on a dump truck and call it a Lamborghini. It's still a <laughs> dump truck, right? Like, and when we do see that a little bit, you know, like versions of that existing in the music industry and, and yes. where someone might have really polished production, but the song sucks. Uh, but sometimes those songs can still find a life of their own on TikTok. You know, I mean, we've all heard songs that, didn't exactly uh, strike a chord in our heart and soul lyrically that still worked because they just had the right melody or the right beat or the right instrumentation placement at the right times. So yeah, it's, it's, I always am really compelled and curious about what the process of, of gatekeepers like yourself who are taking product to the marketplace. Cause I, I feel the same way on the live side. It's like, I will work with an artist because I think the quality is there, but also if I feel I can translate that excitement through my pitch. And there are plenty of artists out there that that I respect and I, I they're obviously successful, but I personally don't get them enough to feel like I can gravitate to their brand to really add value on top of whatever it is they're already doing in the marketplace. And I'm sure you have those moments too, where you're like, hey, listen, this guy, this guy or this gal or this band, they're successful. I personally don't get it. Yeah. I had a case last week where somebody came to me, you know, and said, you know, through a manager, hey, we really, you know, this is really good. This was, it was click, it was click wrap trap, it was what it was called. I don't even know what that means, but I certainly heard it. And it was, it was a guy with an auto-tune voice and, you know, a lot of clicking, you know, as in drum clicking or a click track. And the problem with it, you know, I heard nine songs trying to find a song. I couldn't even get to the 10th. Two of them had something original to them that were, were, were kind of interesting. But I said to the manager, I said, there's nothing here. I, I don't know. You, your, your person has to go back and, you know, lean forward a lot more and, you know, and bring some of that, that what he did on these other two tracks, a lot more forward towards that. And then, you know, then maybe there's an opportunity, but, you know, and that was, that was for a, you know, a small pile of money and money. You know what, Jim, money does not, you know, money does not get me excited at all. Yes, I pay my bills. Yes, I need X amount of money to buy the good, my good crazy clothes or whatever I'm doing, you know, that sort of thing. Now I need money for my, uh, my movie ventures. But the point of this is, is that kind of like, I'm not going to take the money just because, because that's a, that's a sign right there that, you know, this person's not going to, this is not going to be good for that person. And there's, there's too many people in the music business that are taking people's money for for that that same reason. I know you gotta got to feed, you know, and I know you gotta eat, and I know you gotta have a roof over your head. But don't take a poor innocent artist money just because you can spin them a yarn to get them what? That's you know one station, two features. Well, it's got to be a bigger puzzle than that. Where are you? Where is the planning for everything before radio? If radio to me, is at the end, you've got a lot of work to do, come before. Any of the artists that, you know, I'm very fortunate to work with on MDM, you know, maybe not so much Tyler Joe, although Tyler Joe had four years ahead behind him before he got signed. So he was preparing in a lot of ways. But if there isn't that, you know, I mean, you know, I find, you know, you see how Mike Denny got Jess Moskaluk, you know, off the internet. She was doing covers. Well, it took a long time after that before we finally got, you know, you know, cheap wine and cigarettes. And I can't remember the number, but success takes a long time. And most, a lot of, most artists that come to me don't want to spend the time. They want to have, get this, like I said, manager, song on the radio, play a giant stadium. That's what they want. And that's what they think. And then you tell them it's going to take 10 years. And you better, I hope you write one good song out of that because what you currently have, you don't have. And they're like, bye-bye. <laughs> You're the wrong guy for me. You're not telling me what I want to hear. You're telling me what I need to hear. You, um, uh, you speak to something there that I'd like to actually delve into just a little bit more before we talk about your film, which I do want to talk about. Thank you. Um, what advice do you give artists who are sourcing the marketplace for agents, managers, trackers, uh, record companies, if you're not in a position where you can take them on, what type of advice do you give them so that they can steer clear of some of the more um, uh, nefarious uh, characters in this business who really don't add value, but somehow they still float around for a decade or more? 
Yeah. I suggest that they do the research on that person or people completely and then have a conversation with them and find out what is their interest in you. Have they listened to the music? A lot of times people don't listen to the music. They just go payday, right? And say, make sure that look at their past record. Look at what they've done before. Do they have a plan and strategy for you? Do they? If How many of artists are they working? If they're working five artists at a time, guess what? Only one's getting on. And if you're the fifth, that how I don't know how you get on then. So it's really about digging in and finding out. I'm fortunate on my side, at least when it comes to the consulting side, is I have a couple great people that I know that I trust, no different than myself at radio, at social media, at advertising, right? I have a PR. I ha I but because I've been around a little while, so it helps. But I, I, I know where I can send people if they have the goods and I can deliver, help them deliver the goods because I've got to pitch those people to come aboard. I can't just go to a PR team like Red Umbrella, Charlotte, and go, well, I got this, this, and this, and she's going to, she'll have a half a dozen questions for me. If she even gets to this, the, the, the first three, if she gets to the first three, she might go, I'm good, right? You know, I have to convince her or everybody else there's a reason to do this. And there's a reason then to take somebody's money, not because we need it, but because we get paid for the services. And so, again, we started by talking about research. I say data and research again. It's all about that drill down. You drill down on that. Yes, it's going to take some time. Yes, you want to find out about it. But just don't take somebody's word like mine just because. Take, find out about me. Ask around. Because if you're dropping good dough, you're at that good dough. Unless you've got a money tree, then you know what? Then I can visit, then I'll talk to you about something else. But, you know, otherwise, dig deep and find out who those people are and what they do and what they've worked. And if you see them, and not everybody has to have a number one success, you know what? But you want to see you want to see them being able in whatever genre they're in. And, I mean, look at rock nowadays. It's brutally hard, right? <clears throat> you know, there's not a ton of songs they're adding nowadays. There, there just aren't. Well, then find that radio tracker that does really well at rock, the success, have a long chat with them, and then find out what their strategy is for you. Yeah, and credibility, you. credibility is key. Um, a lot of times, all, especially as it pertains to management, uh, management components or agent components, I will recommend that if an artist is interested in a manager, for example, and that manager is interested in them, that that artist gets the opportunity to speak to some of that manager's clients to find out from the people they work with today what the weaknesses and strengths are, right? And and I've always felt that if uh, if my clients that I currently represent can't say nice things about me, then uh, I'm probably in the wrong business, or I'm you know I need to step up my game. And so uh, so anyway, those are some great um, great points of interest that I think you've dispensed there for independent artists or emerging artists. Let's talk a little bit about what you've done with this film. So you're releasing a film on YouTube. Uh, tell us about the origin story and, and the genesis of this idea and where it came from and what you're planning to do with it. Thank you so much for asking, Jim. It is a real, it's a real pleasure to be able to talk about this because this is a true love of mine, so close to music, so close. Um, I never thought, as I said earlier, that I, you know, I knew I was a creative person, but I didn't know what, what kind. And I went through sculpting and painting and I was never a singer. I not, I can't play piano or anything like that. I'm not a, I'm not that, but I'm good with people. That was my start right there to understand, to understand myself. And then the other piece was I've been through a lot of, you know, self-examination and meditation over the last 10 years. And it brought me to that point of really bringing myself to myself as in, you know what, I really didn't like myself or love myself. I hated myself. And I always would put on a show or as I thought it was a show. And of course, it was great. Right. Because everybody else could see that. But I was not a happy guy. And so I went through the nutrition of that. And if, Jim, if somebody would have told me 10 years ago, hey, Dale, this is what you're going to do. I would have I don't know if I would have done it. I don't think I would have had the cones to do it because the deep pits I've had to go through of digging, dealing with my stuff. And it's just my stuff. You know, there was always that. With, well, that Jim said this about me. So therefore, well, maybe he complimented you. Did you ever think of that? But no, not me. I would take it as, oh, well, Ooh, geez, he's being mean to me. And it's not the case at all. So by meeting myself 
and doing all these things. It brought me to the point where, of course, um, when the pandemic started, um, I, I went and lived with my, I have a, a place in Toronto, but I left that place um, to rent uh, or lease out. And then I lived with my girlfriend on Lake Erie and we were going to be there for a while. She has a house right on Lake Erie. Well, there's no way to cut grass. So I went and bought myself a John Deere. Woohoo! I got a John Deere, you know? And so I started doing that. I got had fun with it. And then Mike Denny said, well, what's your latest thing? What's going on? And I go, okay, I've got some ideas for some clothes. And so what I did was I did more of a capsulation as opposed to me walking around. I did some more stuff that kind of intrinsically made me feel freer towards the whole idea of doing that. Right. So as opposed to me always looking in a mirror going, you can't, you can't, you can't. I turned it around and go, yeah, I can. And I'll never forget, you know, the very first day I just when I started storyboarding this movie of mine called Spiders, I just started storyboarding and kind of go, this is a cool idea. Why spiders? I've always liked spiders. Spiders move forward. They don't move backwards. You take their web down. It continues to get built. It gets built again. And the thing about the spiders in, in on, off of Lake Erie is that because those winds now are 20 to 70 kilometers pending the day. Brutal. But those threads of that web are sometimes so strong. I've actually had to hit them and bounce back. I mean, there's the tenacity of a spider understanding what it needs to catch food in order to feed itself. Right. So to me, spiders were interesting that way. Not as interested in reptiles, other animals. Nah, it's not so as there's true. something about how spiders interact with the world that yes. you found metaphorical or allegorical to uh, maybe your own journey in, in completely moving forward and being wow, resilient. Thank you. <laughs> I didn't even crystallize that. Jim. <laughs> but thank you for crystallizing that for me, because that's that's going to help me <laughs> to, when I think when I get off this podcast, I'm going to go, holy smokes. But it's so true. And so then from there, you know, I just I just said, OK, I, I set a date and I'm going, I'm ordering the spiders from Amazon because you can order eight foot and 10 foot spiders from Amazon. Right. So I did that. I ordered them. They arrived. Then I went across the street to uh, my buddy's place, who became my buddy during the pandemic. And I said, hey, listen, I got these spiders. I got this idea. And I just kind of threw him a few things of what I was looking to do. And he said, leave it with me. I'll help you. This spider movie is three minutes and 21 seconds long. I probably took an hour and a half worth of footage, right? But the thing was, it was about the story. It's about a story of these giant spiders who come to Wayne Fleet and take over. And so that was the thought process. So then my executive producer calls me the next day and he goes, I got this whole idea for a boom. It's gonna be a boom and it's gonna be wires because we did everything, you know, like the good old days with fishing wire. There's no CG. You can tell in this movie, these aren't real, but that's the fun of it. And I said to him, I said, uh, when I talked to my girlfriend about it originally, she says, well, why are you doing this? I said, I'm doing this to make me laugh. And I don't know if I've ever said that before, but I did. And all we did was laugh our asses off every time we did something and had so much fun. And that's how the movie got made was because of I was willing to just leave my own self at the door. I remember the first morning of my first shoot and I got up, I go, I can't, I can't do this. And then I realized, I go, why? What are you doing? Of course you can do this. If you can do that and ride a John Deere tractor around, why can't you do this with a camera, with your iPhone 7X, whatever it is, right? And that's what I did, right? And it was because of that idea and dream and the synopsis that I created. Because all it is, is it's spiders invading this these three houses, right? And that's all it is. It's me running from one space to another space to see my poor dead friend across the street. Don't, don't give it all away. Spoiler alerts. Yeah. I, yeah, yeah. I won't give it all away, you know, to a part where you're seeing a, what, one of my neighbors, she's using a cast iron pan and she is like, she's acting, she's 14. She's acting her life away, beating off these spiders. It was so great. Everybody that worked with me on this was so excited about it because it was nothing they ever did. Nothing I ever did. And then to cut for it to all come together. And then when I said it to my editor, who is Travis Nesbitt um, in Edmonton, I mean, he had the vision already because he talked to me and he said, OK, well, what do you want to do? Why do you want to do it? What do you want to do? And I said, I want funny film noirish Hitchcock because Hitchcock to me is he's I love Hitchcock, but I love what Hitchcock does. He looks for ways to get the story out more. And if that means less editing, 
That is his whole plight was his whole plight was less editing, more story. So I really took that upon myself, shot that. And then sent, so and I talked to Travis about this. And then he came back to me. He sent it to me on a Wednesday. I was on a Zoom call. And I looked at that. He sent it to me on my phone. And I'm kind of like, okay. And I go, yeah, that looks like a cool movie. He goes, no, no, no. Have you watched? You need to call me when you're done. And so I finished my call and I look. And I'm sitting there in tears because he was able to, no different how you crystallized the thought for me. He did the same. He added bits and pieces that made that movie funnier, but also a story which I had not got around to. And so he did that, you know, and so there I am watching it. And it was just, it was so much beyond when, when somebody else can take your dream and make it into what you didn't even dream about. The elation, the high yes. off that, no different than with music. When you talk about that, the high off music, there is an understand anywhere. your vision. And then they're able to actually add to it. I uh, unfortunately have to wrap this up right away, but where do people find this movie? So you'll find it. It's out on uh, October 13th. It will be on YouTube, which, and it'll be under Derp Productions, D-E-R-P Productions. Right on. Well, I'm going to encourage people to go check it out. Thanks again for taking the time to do this today and sharing your knowledge. And uh, great as always to see you, my friend. I appreciate you. Thank you, Jim. I appreciate you.